For years, I've felt like my taste in movies hasn't really met whatever standard cinema culture has set as prestigious or award-worthy or the best of the best. AKA, most of the movies I watch and enjoy are owned by Disney. In fact, I feel like you could measure my life by Disney-owned franchises. Ages 6 to 11, I was obsessed with Disney princesses. Around the age of 12, I switched from Anna and Elsa to Steve Rogers and Tony Stark. During my teenage years, I fell in love with the world of Star Wars. I've never seen Pulp Fiction or The Godfather, but I have seen every single Star Wars movie, including the Holiday Special, and every MCU movie to date. Although this is the only corner of the movie world that I'm pretty well versed in, I'm happy to be in this corner. I like the idea of constantly going back to the same universe. The MCU and Star Wars universes both seem to be their own ecosystems. You almost feel like they exist even when you're not watching. You get to see these characters develop separately, and you get to see them cross over and react to new environments. You get to see how different artists interpret the same world in a way that only the franchise format allows. My favorite part of these films, though, is the sense of community that surrounds them. There's a multitude of people that care about these characters and worlds just as much as I do, and we have earnest emotional reactions to the films. We invest our time and money into these franchises, we take them seriously, we thoroughly enjoy them, and we view them as art, as pretentious as it sounds. So when someone of important standing within the film world makes a passing statement that delegitimizes something you're passionate about, well, you get kind of defensive. Of course I'm talking about Martin Scorsese. In an interview with Empire Magazine, the filmmaker stated, I don't see them. I tried, you know, but that's not cinema. Honestly, the closest I can think of them, as well made as they are, with actors doing the best they can under the circumstances, is theme parks. It isn't the cinema of human beings trying to convey emotional, psychological experiences to another human being. And then, the nation was divided. At least, Twitter was. There's people that took it a little too far on both ends. Some Scorsese stands said that just because he's a talented, well-seasoned director, that his word is the cinematic bible and that us monkey brains dare not question him. Some Marvel stands called Scorsese a garbage director when they've probably never seen a single one of his movies in the first place. In this video, I won't be making jams at Scorsese's films because I've only ever seen one, and to be honest, I can barely remember it. I won't be questioning his legitimacy as a filmmaker either because that would be a crappy thing to do. The only thing I'll be criticizing in this video is his statements against Marvel movies and the philosophy about cinema that it implies. Anyway, all of this controversy culminated in a New York Times opinion piece written by Scorsese himself titled, I said Marvel movies aren't cinema, let me explain. I'll put the link in the description if you want to read the piece for yourself, but I condensed the article into three main points that I'll be covering today. According to him, Marvel movies aren't cinema because they lack aesthetic, emotional, and spiritual revelation. They lack an individual artist's vision. They lack risk. He also makes a point about how the franchise system is harming independent film exhibition, but today I'll be focusing on the creative qualities of Marvel films instead of what effect they have on the film market. There's a lot to unpack here, so let's get into it. I don't feel the need, in, when I hear his statement, to argue for Black Panther because I know what we did. You know what I'm saying? I know, you know, that if, if I looked at what his criteria is for, for, for cinema, you know, uh, well, we, that's what we did, you know? And even down to not just the risk of the film, but the risk of, of the characters. In Scorsese's think piece, he says, for me, cinema was about revelation. It was about characters, the complexity of people, and their contradictory and sometimes paradoxical natures. The way they can hurt one another and love one another and suddenly come face to face with themselves. And claims that Marvel films don't display any of that. You know, maybe you're right. I can't think of a single Marvel movie that explores the complexity of human nature, the way people can hurt one another and love one another and suddenly come face to face with themselves. 
Clearly, Martin Scorsese has never seen Black Panther. Black Panther is the story of a man coming to terms with the mistakes his ancestors have made and growing beyond them, while simultaneously being a commentary on the African diaspora and the isolating emotional effect it can have on people of African descent. It's explorative of culture, spirituality, politics, and humanity in an honest and brave way. I'd actually like to argue that the fantastical and ever-expanding world of Marvel means that if the films are done right, they accomplish the exact opposite of what Scorsese claims. Every arguably bad Marvel movie depends too heavily on lore and spectacle and uses emotion as a side piece, while every arguably good Marvel movie has a strong emotional core and uses the elements of the superhero genre to elevate it and make it even more powerful. The isolation and anger of Eric Killmonger, the inner emotional conflict of T'Challa, and the ideological tension between both of these characters is heightened by the genre, not dampened by it. Imagine taking away the quote-unquote franchise elements of this film. I'm sure it would be an intriguing political drama, but it wouldn't have the same worldwide impact that it did. I did some brainstorming on what is arguably the most individualistic Marvel film in my opinion. One can make an argument for Captain America the Winter Soldier and how the Russo brothers put the MCU through a grounded, gritty, conspiratorial filter, or how James Gunn's humor is just as entertainingly obnoxious as the colorful 70s soundtrack universe that surrounds it in Guardians of the Galaxy. But in my opinion, the Marvel film with the most distinct lens is Thor Ragnarok, directed by Taika Waititi. Prior to Ragnarok, Waititi was purely an indie filmmaker. Not that Marvel hasn't done this before, from Jon Favreau to Chloe Zhao, one of Marvel Studios' signature moves is entrusting smaller up-and-coming filmmakers with blockbuster budgets. I think the reason why Waititi was such a surprising choice, though, was his offbeat style and the fact that it was drastically different than the style of the first two Thor films. After one or two films, usually a series has an established feel and the subsequent movies don't steer too far from that feel. I guess one could argue that Captain America, The First Avenger, The Winter Soldier, and Civil War all have different tones, but I think that they all have a trademark groundedness that makes them feel like a unified set. But the Thor series was desperately needing of a revamp as far as tone went. Thor and Thor The Dark World weren't good, but they also weren't bad. They were just there. There was no cinematic reason for them to exist, and it seemed like the creators behind these films had nothing to say. They were like, here's Thor doing stuff, and here's Thor doing more stuff. And we were like, okay, fine, but what's the point? Then along came Thor Ragnarok. After watching the third installment of the Thor series, not only do you feel like you know the personalities and values of each character, but you know the personality and values of Waititi. It's irreverent, colorful, bizarre, and self-aware. It's campy while also being genuine, and a heartfelt story about brotherhood, friendship, second chances, and the meaning of home. It is, unexpectedly, one of the most objectively well-made films to enter the Marvel canon so far. And I don't think it would have been as great of a film if Marvel didn't let Taika Waititi do his thing. Waititi describes the studio's role in the filmmaking process as more of a rational advisor than an authoritarian figure. And if I veer too far out of my lane, I know that Marvel will be there to kind of keep me in the lane, you know? And it's much like, um, it's much like helming a ship and you're on this ocean and you look over there and you see, oh, what's that interesting little speckle on the on the horizon and you kind of steer your ship towards it and that's what I did basically like every day and some days Marvel would say, no Taika, steer your ship away because that's an iceberg and you're going to crash the uh, the studio. Scorsese says that the individual artist is the riskiest factor of all, and implies that Marvel Studios tosses away that factor. But when you watch Ragnarok, you can tell that this is an individual artist's vision. It has one of the most undeniably unique styles in the Marvel canon, and it's evident just by watching the film that there is a singular driving force behind this film, and that force is the director.
Scorsese points out that franchise films are market researched, audience tested, vetted, modified, re-vetted, and remodified until they're ready for consumption. And he is right. But I don't think a studio viewing a film as a consumable product necessarily discredits the film as a piece of cinema. It just means that a film studio is doing its job. For better or for worse, Disney is a capitalist media conglomerate that has one main intention, to make money. Disney puts a crap ton of money into these films, makes a crap ton of merch surrounding these films, and does a crap ton of advertising to get butts in seats. It's a business. It operates the way that every other business does under American capitalism. You put cash into a thing, you have to earn that cash back, and then some, or else your business will fail. Which means that Disney has to do the audience testing process and make sure that people who see these movies will respond well to them. But I don't think modifying a film for an audience is necessarily a bad thing for film, it's just a different thing. Marvel has a unique relationship with its audience, as do most films with the fandom surrounding them. The characters, though legally owned by a corporation, seem to belong to an audience. That's why we write fan fiction, partake in cosplay, make fan art, and dedicate websites, forums, and conventions to these characters. And if Marvel's creators didn't actively listen to its audience during the filmmaking process, I don't think the audience would have the same sense of ownership of these worlds and characters as we currently do. Scorsese also argues that Marvel is formulaic, and that it prevents the element of risk. I'd agree that Marvel is formulaic, but that formula is risk. He seems to think that the people who flock to see these movies are brainwashed by the franchise machine. If people are giving only one kind of thing and endlessly sold one kind of thing, of course they're going to want more of that one kind of thing, he says. How can I put this? Let's say your favorite food is mac and cheese. Mac and cheese is delicious, but imagine if you were fed mac and cheese for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every single day of your life. You open up your cupboard, and the only thing in there is mac and cheese. You go to the store, and the only thing that they're selling is, you guessed it, mac and cheese. After a week or two, you would probably hate mac and cheese with every fiber of your being. You wouldn't crave more of it. You would want something different. What I'm trying to say is that humans get bored easily. We want our tastes to be challenged. We're constantly seeking out new experiences, and when we set out to watch something, we want to be surprised. If the MCU wasn't continually flipping the superhero genre on its head, aka if it was continually feeding us mac and cheese, we would taper off. This is the Marvel business model. Experimentation, reinvention, and yes, risk. My personal philosophy is that every film is art because art is simply any subjective vision contained within a medium. Meaning that Transformers and The Perfect Date and the Star Wars Holiday Special can be just as much of a piece of artwork as Casablanca or Arrival. Although I believe Marvel films do meet the standards for what Scorsese calls cinema, I don't think those standards should exist in the first place. People shouldn't have to incessantly defend the legitimacy of the things they create and enjoy, and no one should attempt to delegitimize those things in the first place. Distinguishing a certain type of film as not art outcasts the creators that work on these films, and it makes the people that are devoted to these films feel like their taste is less than. If we have the mindset that any piece of entertainment can be art, or in Martin Scorsese's words, cinema, then we can eliminate this weird, unnecessary, and frankly pretentious hierarchy that exists in every form of art, but especially film. Why are we narrowing the definition of cinema when it should be limitless? Well, it's too late for them to change the name to Marvel Attic Universe. Of course it's cinema! It's at the movies. It's in cinemas. Near you. Fair enough. Good point. Marvel Cinema Tech Universe. Okay. Scene. <laughs>